Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you could head over to patreon.com slash oxum. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash a-k-s-u-m. You could also join the YouTube channel directly at various levels if you are watching this on YouTube. Today, our special guest is Father Elias Durham. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, thrilled to be here with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for honoring my invitation, as we are want to say in Amharic. You and I met through the auspices of the, the Ephesus School. So I think it would be great to tell people maybe how you first heard of the Ephesus School. I'm always plugging it. It's it's always in my show notes. I'm I'm sending people there. I've, uh, I told you off off screen, I've been a little lackluster in my uh, online production, but I have been producing for <laughs> private individuals as it is. And um, anyway, it's it. I've said enough about it. So getting other people to say great things is is always nice. How did you first? How did the Ephesus School get on your radar? And then uh, what you know? Could you talk to my audience about what project that you had with them? Yeah, absolutely. So it we came onto my radar through Father Paul. I was uh, at St. Vlad's as part of the Doctor of Ministry program during one of the on-sites. Uh, this was in pre-COVID times, uh, obviously. And I was having a conversation with the director of the program, Father Sergius Halverson. And I remember saying something about, you know, the ideal, uh, you know, of an Orthodox community that's planted within a neighborhood and blooms there, that's open to all people. And he said, you should talk to my friend. Father Paul, <laughs> who has a parish, you know, I think, you know, in, the, in, in Minnesota or, you know, wherever it is. And uh, I said, okay, can you put us in touch? And so Father Paul and I kind of had a conversation, which like completely blew my mind. Uh, <laughs> blew did, my you, mind. Did, did you know about him at all other than him no. being the friend of the, no? I had no context for what I was getting into. <laughs> That's amazing. And so Father and I started to talk, you know, because he said a lot of things that spoke to my heart. And, you know, as you and I both know, as he himself would probably say, he's probably unconventional in some ways. Mm -hmm. And um, he and I stayed in touch. So if you fast forward a little bit, I had a class project for another demon course, which was missiology. And I had to do a case study on an Eastern Orthodox parish and how they do mission. And Father Paul's parish community came to mind. Mm -hmm. And so I had a chance to speak with him more about his teaching ministry and in particular the Ephesus Network as part of the outreach and the teaching um, of his particular community. And I was able to document that in the case study um, that I did and really got to know him, uh, you know, his priestly heart and his approach to, you know, bringing the Christian life and living the Christian life, which I think is very much reflected uh, in his Ephesus School um, podcast, the one he does with Dr. Richard Benton. So I started loosening and tuning in occasionally. You know, I'm I'm far behind now uh, with other projects, you know, as you are yourself. But it's something that I've come to value a lot. And I think that he gives a very fresh perspective to Scripture. Um, I think sometimes we tend to think we know what Scripture says. And we tend to approach it through the lens of what we think we've already heard. And we fit it into our worldview. And something I value about Father Paul is he challenges a lot of our assumptions. And he really forces you to hear it and apply it to yourself in a new way that is often very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually the goal of the Christian call. It's uh, as I've heard some, yeah, I think Baptists say, God came to afflict the comfort and comfort the comfortable and, and uh, you know, afflict those who are comfortable. So, uh, so, you know, scripture sometimes is meant to afflict us and move us out of our comfort zone. And Father Paul is really good about bringing that out. Amen. Yeah, may it truly uh afflict us and i think he would take no offense at all to you being behind on the podcasts uh his tarazi tuesdays or the bible is literature with father mark and dr richard but both in combination it's all the same thing and my podcast to how bible study and all the others in the in the network because he always says as long as you're doing the main task which is i'm, I'm sure you're doing is consuming scripture on your own which he always talks about his his teachings or his homilies as invitation cards, like invitation cards to weddings. Uh, and the main feast is you consuming the scripture itself. So it, it, 
as as long as you're not falling behind in that category, I'm sure he is delighted, uh, and I'm sure he's enjoyed his time with you as I've enjoyed uh, our our brief time together as well. And then you weren't just this sort of third party observer uh, yeah. for your own studies. You and I ended up participating. Uh, I believe this this was in uh, 2020. Maybe it was 2021. It was during the summer, I remember, and yeah. racism was on everybody's uh, racism, yeah, on everyone's mind. And of course, I think Father Mark was one of the organizers. Holly Benton as well. Uh, I think working with the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative, which has been doing some great work of late, uh, especially since she's been involved with them. But you know, he wasn't just going to tackle racism from a neutral perspective or just tackle racism from a secular perspective, but the idea of tackling it from the point of view of scripture and then more specifically uh, from the epistle to the Galatians uh, from the apostle Paul. So I did a chapter of that and and you did a, a chapter of that. So you you entered us in, in, in a certain way. Could you talk to us about that that experience and what, what was it like for you or you know, I know I'm digging back in the past a little, but if you if you remember any of that. Yeah, no, it was a really wonderful experience. Like one of the things that Father Paul taught me and it's really stuck with me, he speaks about scripture as self-critique, right? And he talks about the model of um, the Roman household as being the backdrop of St. Paul's writings. And so that it's something that I incorporated into the lesson I gave on the Orthodox conversations on racism, but that kind of ties very much into how I see the Christian life in, in my own ministry, right? We, um, we tend to take other identities and layer them on top of who we are as Christians, you know, in our particular confessional identities, you know, whether we're Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox or, you know, Catholics or Protestants, whatever we are. We, we layer all these other things on top of that. Oh, I'm conservative, I'm liberal, you know, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other. And I think the, the study we did together on Galatians was an opportunity to kind of peel back the onion, so to speak, and to talk about our fundamental identity as people uh, in God's household, right? And so, you know, and to talk about the fact that first and foremost, right, we're part of God's household and that comes with certain obligations. and just as scripture is self-critique, uh, we look at the world through the lens, not of critiquing others, but of critiquing ourselves, um, even when it seems that others are being unjust. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was an interesting exercise in turning the lens of scripture on myself and then applying that to the conversation that was happening within the broader culture on racism, because it, it tends to be a very sensitive topic and it inflames people and it makes them really want to get angry and point the finger about who's doing what to whom, which is never helpful. Uh, but when we as Christians can pause and say, what part am I playing in this? Uh, then I think we are able to move forward. Now, in the context, right, you know, people would look at you and I and say, well, you guys really clearly can't be racist. You don't fall into the category. Uh, <laughs> but I would say, yeah. yeah we, under the new definitions of the yeah, term. Exactly. But uh, clearly, you know, we're fallen human beings who are capable of othering other people, right? And scripture doesn't give us permission to do that. It calls us to a very different standard and a very different approach. Uh, and we have to see all people really through the lens uh, of either members of God's household or prospective members of his household and treat them accordingly. So did I answer your question? I feel like I kind of- You, you did, you did. Um, and, and we don't have to dwell too long on, you know, what the non-church perspective is, but obviously the non-church perspective that we're kind of referencing the elephant or the 800 pound gorilla in the room is that they're, they're redefinitions of the term and of the idea it include uh, a lot of power relations and power dynamics, right? And so you and I as black Americans would be considered not of power and not capable uh, of it at all and and almost you know in a an eternal victimization and that that's not to trivialize in any way the obvious and unique history particularly you know my family's more recently immigrants but 
the black Americans that have been here much longer, many more, more moons than, than my family has, have really uh, unique historical qualms to, to raise and, and to address. Um, but yeah, you, you're, you're saying that particularly for the, the household of God, uh, whatever the, the power dynamic may be, uh, and I think this is another point stressed by the Ephesus School a lot, that, that context is always very important and that particularly as, as contexts change, there's always some way to look for our role in the matter as opposed to just lifting the blame off ourselves and, and pointing at each other. Is that, is that a fair version of what you're saying? Yeah, no, that's perfect. And it's much more eloquent than I was stumbling through. And you bring up another point as well, right? It's the members of the household. Like for us, the watchword isn't about power. It's about service. You know, uh, Paul uses the term, you know, our, our gentle translations today, servants of Christ. Uh, yes. I know it's doulos, Christi, slaves, right? Uh, and so if we can begin to see ourselves as slaves of the master, um, slaves of God, uh, and the fact that we have no power and that we're simply, when we're out in the world, we're his representatives, that really kind of changes things, right? I'm not doing anything in my name, even if I'm acting as a priest, especially if I'm acting as a priest, I'm not doing it in my name. And it's not about power. It's about service. And I think when we look at the cross, what we see is the power dynamics of this world turned absolutely upside down on their head. And I think that's what people struggle with. Yes, that that <laughs> it is an eternal struggle of the cross, which I often always point out to people because it's an image or a symbol that's been totally flipped on its head or made topsy turvy. People tend to forget the connotations it had in Christ's time before he converted it, before he flipped it on its head which is really, you know, it's the opposite. It was a tool of death and and spreading the fear of death converted into a tool of life and uh, spreading hope of life. Like it's a total uh, inversion from what its use was uh, by by the Romans. And, and you bring up uh, a great segue. I like how we got into it, just discussing about how you and I got connected and what connected us. Uh, and we, we left it more mysterious up to the audience, but definitely want to talk to them about it now, too. Uh, in this context, I actually had a few friends, uh, three, uh, on this program. One, uh, who's a repeat offender, he's been on a few times, uh, who are all from the Catholic University of America in, in D.C. Two Ethiopian Orthodox uh, deacons and uh, one brother who is uh, a Black American friend of mine who's been on the program and is a, a more recent convert to Catholicism and is in the uh, uh, the Josephite order uh, and you know he's per before he was before he was in the order is when he was on my program but he'll be back on my program again. W one of the things that he tells me both on and off camera is he was drawn to. Uh, the many jurisdictions that are within Catholicism because it had this connection and because it, it reached out, it, it, it incorporated the kind of, you know, gospel music into the liturgy that may have been more common in, in Protestant circles because it was trying to create an authentic right within America that wasn't Irish or Italian or, uh, you know, later Filipino or whatever it may be. So, could you tell my audience, uh, you know, which church you are uh, a priest in, and 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 how you how you got there, taking as as much time or as little time as you'd like? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a priest uh, of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church, <clears throat> and so I've just said a bunch of words that a few people may. <laughs> what did he just say? So, so really, the 18th century, uh, the term Melkite was applied for those. Um, Christians who followed the king, Melek, uh, you know, the Chalcedonian Christians in the Middle East, and particularly the Sea of Antioch. But in Antioch in 1724, there was an unintended schism. And so there was a falling out between two factions, the Greek Orthodox Arab Christians and the Greek Orthodox Arab Christians who had leanings towards greater and closer ties with the Latin church. Um, for different reasons. 
And, you know, if you want to add to the mix, the Ottoman Turks, uh, and then the power dynamics of Constantinople, just down the way, um, you know, who really had cognizance over all the Christians in the area, it made for a potent mix of misunderstandings. And so long story short, you know, after about 100 years of bloody fighting, there emerged in the Sea of Antioch, both uh, a Catholic branch and a, an Orthodox branch, which were before there had only been one church. So the Melkites uh, in the United States are those, uh, well, I was going to say those Arab Christians. It's the Church of Antioch. So traditionally, it was an Arab church in the Middle East, um, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, right? Now they're in the diaspora as they came to these shores. Non-Arab Christians became exposed to the Melkite church. Uh, really were drawn to the cultural heritage and to the liturgical expression of apostolic Christianity they, they found there. And so today the Melkite church has a number of what we like to, to smilingly call blue-eyed Melkites. Those <laughs> of us who are not uh, of Arab extraction and who are now Melkites by adoption as opposed to by culture. So what a lot of people don't realize is that when you say Catholic, it doesn't mean Roman Catholic automatically. Uh, it means one of 20, I believe, three uh, self-governing churches, of which the Roman church happens to be the largest, and the other 22 are all Eastern churches. Um, and I know off camera, you and I were talking about some of those Eastern churches in union with Rome, you know, within your own uh, context. The, in the Ethiopia Eritrea. and in Eritrea, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we celebrate the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, except for during Great Lent or Christmas, where we celebrate the liturgy of St. Basil. Uh, and so our liturgical life, our spiritual life, our cultural heritage, our theological outlook is all Orthodox, you know, with a small O, so not part of the orth canonical Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. but drawing from that heritage and from our own mother church, the Greek Orthodox uh, Church of Antioch. But we manifest that uh, in the spirit of communion, ecclesial communion, uh, with the Latin church. And so, you know, people often like to ask us, hey, are you guys under the Pope? And I'll pause and I'll say no, but our patriarch is, you know, alongside the Pope. He's in communion with him. So uh, people tend to think of being in union with Rome as being under the thumb of, of the Pope. And on these shores, for some period of time, the Eastern churches who came here who were in union with Rome uh, did sort of live under the shadow of the older brother church. Uh, but those days are behind us, uh, which is a, a wonderful thing to be able to say. So now we try to exist as sister churches. It's not perfect uh, when you're in bed with a hundred pound gorilla and you're a mouse. Uh, you know, if the gorilla sneezes or rolls over, <laughs> you could have a problem. So you have to remind sometimes the gorilla that you're there and to, to be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love this. I hope I hope this episode could be a reminder or maybe an introduction to some people who don't know even even within that larger catholic tradition maybe they don't know about all of the the church i don't know how you know i don't know if it's in the catechism to virtually to unknown. people of <laughs> we are, the eastern churches in union with rome are virtually unknown both to the roman catholics and to the canonical orthodox and yeah. those who have heard of us don't fully understand who or what we are and have lots of ideas yeah, I have a pretty good idea, and yet there, there's a configuration of like four or five different terms all around the city of Antioch that, that baffles me. Now, you've mentioned the Greek, and I think it's so important to mention the Greek rite as the kind of center, because the Greek church of, of Antioch, and then there's, so there's the Greek one that remains uh, capital O Orthodox, and then the one that's in communion with Rome. But I also know at least two or three other denominations that that claim, you know, Antioch and all the East. And one of them is in communion with me, uh, which is basically the West Syriac rite or Aramaic. And then I, I know there's the, the East Syriac rite, which was maligned for many years, known as the, the Nestorian church. But I think the more and more research comes out, I, I appreciate their, they call themselves the Assyrian church of the East. I've seen the the word Chaldean or Chaldean thrown around a lot. So uh, I know there are the Maronites also in, in Lebanon. So they, there's like a bunch of these groups uh, across a few different what are now nation states. But as you mentioned, 
for several hundred years were either under the the eastern part of the Roman Empire, from which I think the the Melkite or Rumi name comes, and uh, later on the the Ottoman Empire too. So so that when these empires collapse and smaller nation states take over, it it does uh, kind of get confusing. So was Aramaic ever a part of your church's liturgical history, or was that more for the folks that were more inland and it was just Arabic and Greek? No, I think it was primarily Greek and then Arabic with the rise of Islam. Okay. Yes. Yes. That makes, uh, that makes a ton of sense. So how within the various jurisdictions of the Catholic church, did you first hear about the Melkite tradition <clears throat> to then, you know, get onto the, the path to, to priesthood within that particular, when there are so many, I mean, you could have been, uh ukrainian uh, catholic you could have been ethiopian catholic you know there's you could have been anything irish filipino as we said yeah so that's an awesome question so i wasn't really raised in a particularly religious context and when i was at college um at the united states naval academy uh early 90s i remember you know really like it's almost like a storybook right i woke up one morning with just sort of inner disquiet like I knew that something was was dreadfully wrong, but I didn't know what was what it was. And so I spent some weeks trying to figure out, OK, I'm having this very strange inner turmoil, which I don't understand. I've never experienced what's going on. I feel like I'm at this major crossroads in my life and I have to make some big decision. And I remember, you know, uh, going home for vacation and, you know, going by myself to Ocean Beach, which I love the sound of the waves at night. I remember saying just, you know, God, I, I think you're out there and I think you're trying to get my attention. You know, what is it you want from me? And what I, I felt was that God was asking me to, to become part of the church. And for, for me at that time, and I, don't, I can't give you a good explanation as to why this is, but that meant becoming Catholic. Mm -hmm. Why? Maybe because, you know, of the few people I knew who actually went to church. Uh, a good friend was Roman Catholic. You know, I'd been with her and her family. And so, you know, I said to her, you know, I'm thinking about becoming. Excuse Catholic. me, oh, were, there, were there chaplains at the Naval Academy? Oh, yes, thank you. There were chaplains and uh, I, I never had occasion to darken their door or go anywhere near them. <laughs> so this made, you know, it even more interesting. So I said to my friend, you know, I think I, I want to be Catholic. I'm not sure, uh, you know, but I know you're Catholic. So, you know, what do you think I should do? And she said, go talk to Chaplain Hines, great guy. And so I, you know, make an appointment, go and knock on the door and say, hey, I think I want to be Catholic. Um, let's talk. So we had a conversation and I essentially was enrolled as a catechumen. You know, he gave me my first catechetical book to read. Uh, I read it. And so I went back to him in a month and I said, OK, I'm ready to be baptized. And he just kind of laughed at me, kind of like the expression you gave me when I said that. And he says, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, this kind of went on for the next year, year and a half. Uh, and eventually they let me in. So I remember, you know, three different priests being there to receive me as I was, was baptized and then uh, later confirmed. Because, as you know, in the West, uh, unless you're an adult, uh, usually they separate baptism and chrismation. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a whole nother conversation we can get into at another time. So I became a Roman Catholic. You know, I thought a little bit about the priesthood at that time, but I also met my wife uh, along the same timeline. And in the Latin West, yeah, priesthood and, and married life don't go together. That's right. Um, and was she raised Catholic? Not, or At least not normally, but there are some exceptions. She actually, there's a funny story in there. She was baptized Catholic as a little girl because her dad was a religion hopper but she was raised as an ardent anti-Catholic fundamentalist. Wow. And we met because she was, um, she felt it was her Christian duty to save my soul from becoming <laughs> Catholic. <laughs> the true of story. course, I, I grew up in Los Angeles where I am a teacher and I worked in certain schools in South Los Angeles where there are large Hispanic populations. And they will say to you, are you Catholic or are you Christian? And yeah. by Christian, they mean what you're saying yeah no exactly it is real it's a thing so if you fast forward um a few years uh, after graduation you know my wife and i eventually discerned that the lord was calling us to marriage um, despite our different faith backgrounds and trajectories and so we did get married 
we were looking for, you know, a Roman Catholic church where we could feel at home in the early 90s in San Diego. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we had, a, we'll just say, a variety of different experiences. Uh, of uh, Some were uncomfortable extremely, some were mildly so. But long story short, we found ourselves in what's called a Ruthenian church. And the Ruthenians are basically um, Carpatho-Russians or descendants of Carpatho-Russians um, who came to these shores and who are Eastern Christians in union with Rome. And I had never been to an Eastern Christian liturgy. Mm-hmm. And so there I am in the midst of the liturgy of John Chrysostom, hearing church Slavonic chanted, wow. looking at all the icons that are from floor to ceiling, smelling the incense, looking at the vestments. And there was this part of me inside that said, this is what liturgy is meant to be. Like, this is it. And I was very much um, struck by this. Now, my wife tells me, the priest there sat me down and said, have you thought about being a priest? And, you know, I'm a young Navy officer. I'm like, what are you talking about? (laughs) So um, that was my first exposure to the Christian East. And my wife and I, from that moment, really felt that was our home. Now, we were in the Navy, which means we were subject to moving every so often. Mm -hmm. So we moved to a new duty station. Um, Subsequent or along the same timeline, we had our second child. When we got to our duty station in Monterey, we also looked into adopting. We just thought we would explore the options. Long story short, (laughs) within three months, we had a child placed in our home for adoption. Uh, Three months later, another child came to us, placed for her adoption. And I tell you this because it's part of the story. So we'd gone from two children to four children, six and under, in the course of about six months. Wow. But we were also missing the Eastern liturgy. So we found an Eastern church in union with Rome. It was only an hour away. Didn't sound so bad. So we put the four children, six and under, into the van. We drove an hour for a beautiful liturgy. It was wonderful. We drove an hour home. We looked at each other in the driveway and said, no, <laughs> this isn't going to work. <laughs> so that means we resigned ourselves to continue our sojourn in the Latin West. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that it's inferior or worse. I'm just saying that we weren't ever fully comfortable there after tasting the Eastern liturgy, the liturgy of John Chrysostom. Skip forward a few more years, and I left the Navy in about 2008 and realized that you know the prospect of moving every two to three years was no longer something we had to contend with. And I was also free to begin to discern how God was calling me to serve the church. At the same time, I began to study theology uh, using my GI Bill. I like to chuckle that the government paid for most of my theological education. Phenomenal. Uh, I've never heard of that. (laughs) Yeah, it was, uh, I have served on active duty. I had entitlements to educational benefits. So I made good use of those. And one of my scripture professors was actually, then a subdeacon in the Melkite church who was from a community in our area. It was a community that I had been familiar with. I had visited and, uh, you know, had never considered seriously joining until I started hearing things in his scripture studies like, this is how the early church understood this particular passage. Here's its liturgical implication. And if you go to this church, Holy Transfiguration in McLean, Virginia, you'll see this alive and well today. And so I heard that once or twice (laughs) and, you know, I started thinking, you know, this is very attractive to me. This reminds me of, you know, the feeling I had when we used to go to Eastern churches. Uh, One Sunday, finally, we decided to drive an hour and a half just to kind of check it out. And I remember after the liturgy, my wife said, I don't know where you're going to go next Sunday, but we're all going to be here. (laughs) That was part of the journey. Um, I opened my heart to the priest there. Um, I was completing my theological education and I shared with him my interest, one, in the Christian East and two, in, you know, presenting myself to the bishop as a potential priestly vocation because the um, Melkites had recently began ordaining married men to the priesthood once again on U.S. soil, um, something that Pope Francis helped uh, implement, you know, as part of the new attitude um, so could you clarify that a little bit for for people who don't yeah, know? I, I, I know a little bit about that, but the kind of general policy of the church and then the difference between being, you know, in the motherland versus being on American shores. Yeah, absolutely. That's a spectacular question. So for the most part, 
if you're in the motherland, uh, the patriarch has full jurisdiction with no interference from Rome for the most part, except when it is asked for. And there are times where due to family squabbles, tribal disagreements, you really do need someone to come in and play referee. Um, but in the United States, a different dynamic developed because when the first Eastern Christians who were in union with Rome arrived on these shores, they didn't have their own bishop. So they you know, went to the Latin bishops who for the most part didn't know what to do with these you know, married men who were claiming to be Catholic and you know, <laughs> priests. Uh, so it didn't go well. Uh, in fact, there's a story associated really with the OCA of a large number of Ruthenians who broke communion with Rome and went back to their mother church uh, and went under the Russian Omophorian uh, as, in response to how they were treated when they first arrived here. So it was the policy of um, the Latin church for some period of time that Eastern churches in union with Rome uh, would not ordain married men to the priesthood. So sometimes these married men were ordained in Canada or in the motherland and then you know, brought back here to serve. And uh, my bishop in particular uh, eventually forced the issue by ordaining a married deacon to the priesthood. Uh, afterwards, he was told he couldn't do it. <laughs> Um, he was good friends with a cardinal who happened to be visiting Rome. And essentially, three days later, the Pope reversed the ban that had been in place, you know, for some decades. And my bishop has, I think, ordained about maybe seven to ten married men since 2014. So it's completely changed the dynamic of the Melkite Church uh, here in the States. So that's how I found my way to the Christian East and found my way, I think, to the Melkites in particular, and one thing I appreciate about the Melkites is they're not tied to any particular national identity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Ukrainians are tied to Ukraine, you know, the Ruthenians, Carpathia, Russian region. But the Melkites really, you know, um, are from multiple nationalities within the Middle East. And that gives them a very strong sense of identity and a very strong sense of their apostolic heritage. Okay. Uh, really kind of a pride in who they are. Now, uh, you were probably familiar with this dynamic, you know, coming from an, an immigrant background in the mother country, oftentimes the native churches are poor and their priests maybe are not so well educated, but the Latins have lots of money. Yes. Right. So there's a, there's a mystique to the Latin church. And so we spend a lot of our time, even we convert priests, <laughs> catechizing our people on the fact that we have nothing to be ashamed of that we are a church of equal dignity of equal antiquity that we have different customs that are no less authentic and no less beautiful uh, than those of the christian west um, so it's an ongoing issue of catechesis formation that kind of thing yeah and uh <laughs> i don't want to get you in trouble but maybe more authentic with i mean the, the greco-semitic culture is the culture that Father Paul Adib Tarazi and the entire Ephesus school always speak of. The Greco part, sometimes people get confused about the purpose of it being to spread because Alexander the Great made it the lingua franca of so many areas. So it became very functional in terms of spreading it to the most amount of people. But the Semitic element and that mindset, the when you're talking about tribal conflicts, I, I really think about, you know, the Sheikh culture and that, as that being fundamental to understanding the mentality in in scripture, uh, really as God, God as the Sheikh or the shepherd uh, of us all in the in the wilderness and and all of us as a as a human tribe. So I I, I appreciate that. I'm I'm curious though. Um, I imagine most of their Arabics. Uh, their different dialects are intelligible with each other, but it makes me curious now the liturgical setting because the the various Ethiopian com there's there are Ethiopian communities that have large Caribbean populations, primarily because of Bob Marley and Rastafarianism and things like that. But by virtue of that, in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, um, in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, um, uh, what's another? big one um uh, maybe guyana i don't know but in several of the caribbean islands there are well like established churches since the 50s that have like very powerful english-speaking ministries and just now over the past 
I'd say eight years, and I've taken a part, a huge role in that as well. Me about a decade teaching in English and doing the liturgy in English and singing in English and all that. What you experienced when you came there was it a sort of blend of of a particular dialect of Arabic, or just like the fusa, the the kind of the the formal uh, modern standard Arabic, and then Greek and English, or was it all English, or what was it that you were experiencing liturgically for the liturgy of uh, Saint John Chrysostom? No, great, it's a great question. So, in keeping with the authentic tradition of the Christian East, the liturgy was presented in the language of the people. Um, so, our liturgy is primarily in English although we do have some hymns in Arabic, right? Parts of the liturgy that repeat frequently enough for even the non-native Arab speakers to pick up on the words and to be able to kind of uh, lip sync it, you know, and make their way through. <laughs> and we have a little bit of Greek. So primarily English, a little bit of Greek, a little bit of Arabic. Now, that answer will vary depending on which Melkite community you go to. Because I visited a community in Yonkers, New York about two years ago when I was going to St. Vlad's for an onsite and they had a lot more Arabic mm -hmm. in their liturgy. Now, fortunately, because I was used to doing some of the chants in Arabic, I was able to, to keep along and, you know, sing in the choir and they were all kind of shocked and surprised <laughs> at me on the back. I thanked uh, my Arab and my Arabic instructor back home in Holy Tea. When I got back, I said, thank you for taking the time to teach me. <laughs> um, but, you know, so some communities are more, um, Arabic than others, especially with new migrations. But our bishop is very clear that if you tie your community to being um, an ethnic and a cultural preservation club, you're dooming yourself. Because what happens is the generation that comes, they speak Arabic, they're comfortable with it. Their children may be speaking Arabic at home, but they're not speaking Arabic in the streets and they're not speaking Arabic at school. And so what happens is the only place they hear Arabic is at church and they say, we don't understand it. Well, this is not our church anymore. And so there's a real emphasis to, to you know, keep some Arabic in the liturgy, um, but to realize that on these shores, the language of our children for the most part is English. And so that's the language we need to use in the liturgy. That said, we have a community in Miami that has a very large Hispanic population. And so we have the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom in Spanish. And Espanol. Yeah. So again, you put the liturgy in the language of the people. Uh, just before the pandemic hit, we had a baby who's half Guatemalan, half Ethiopian. And so his Guatemalan family was well in attendance, two, three generations. And uh, me being a Los Angelino and knowing a little bit of Spanish that day, to the surprise of a visiting guest priest, I first sang the traditional is right hymns. We did the liturgy in English. I sang traditional is right hymns in Spanish that I translated. And then I did a short, about five, 10 minute homily in Spanish uh struggling as as i could and they they enjoyed it uh, very much uh i've had uh, random people because we're often in in south central los angeles and in other adjacent areas i've had sometimes random hispanic people from the community walk into the church and i remember one time giving this white shawl this natala to one and uh, on the fly translating the liturgy as best as i can with my intermediate spanish uh, it's happened a couple of times, and then we give them a book or something, and uh, you don't often see an immediate effect of that because I think it's jarring for them to step into that. But but I hope I hope uh, my bishops uh, <laughs> are listening to you, and uh, if not them, their children who will relay the message about how to feed the community. And I know people who watch my channel already have a similar mindset, but I think to hear it emphasized time and again with different examples is very important. I know uh, you and your bishop have also discussed sometimes this dichotomy people say between addressing the children and addressing the parents. Are, are there any thoughts yeah. around, around that that you could share with us? Yeah, I would love to. So, you know, off camera, you and I were talking about your teaching ministry. And I shared with you a comment that he made actually very recently 
And he said, you know, I feel like we, we took the wrong approach early on in this country because we focused only on the children, but we sent them home to uncatechized parents. And the problem is most Christians um, stop learning about their faith when they finish Sunday school, whenever that is. And that's whether you're uh, an Orthodox Christian, an Eastern Catholic, uh, a Latin, Roman Catholic, or a Protestant. Now, you may say, oh, no, no, our, our church has lots of Bible studies. We go to Bible study all the time. But if you're kind of, um, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but if you're kind of treading the same pasture over and over again and just getting really familiar with it and memorizing the favorite words and passages of your Bible teacher, you're not necessarily learning anything. And so it's super important to focus on the adults and to focus on teaching the adults what it means to live the Christian life. Like, for example, like I shared with you earlier, when I met Father Paul, it blew my mind. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Um, but this whole idea of realizing, you know, we're part of the household of God. And what does that mean? Like, that's an ongoing, lifelong lesson um, that we don't assimilate as quickly as we think because we're challenged every day. And we live within a cultural context, which is completely contrary to that. And so it's not enough for us to take our Sunday school education and attempt to navigate the complex world in which we live today as faithful Christians, because it's not meant to be something we do just on Sundays, right? It's not meant to be um, something that is relegated to, okay, I'm going to give a little bit of money, you know, I'll show up at church when my mother bothers me, uh, you know, and I'll have my kids baptized and then, you know, go back for their wedding and, you know, go to my, you know, my auntie's funeral other than that, I don't really have time for it. No, it's meant to be a complete lifestyle. And I would argue the Christian East traditionally has been better about this than the West. I would say traditionally, because we're in a global world and there's lots of cultural interchange now. And I think that what used to be the hallmark of the Christian East is beginning to fade. But if you yeah. think about it under the oppression either of the Ottomans or the communists, uh, you didn't have a choice but to cling to your faith. So that sh that tree was shaken. So if you weren't serious, you fell away. And so the only Christians who were left in those contexts were those who took it very seriously and were willing to to suffer and even to die for it. So I feel that um, part of our challenge today is to teach the adults what it means to actually live a Christian lifestyle. Because if we don't do that, it doesn't matter if we catechize the children, because they're going to go home. And they're going to see something completely antithetical to what we just taught them. If we get them for an hour a week, okay, include the homily, okay, an hour and 10 minutes <laughs> a week. Uh, and then we send them home and their parents are living like non-Christians or even like, you know, pagans. And I don't mean it, again, disrespectfully, uh, those, those children are, are going to leave the church. They're not going to stay because they're not seeing it lived out by their biggest role models, which are their parents. Yeah, I don't want to be defeatist, but I remember a friend of mine and I, we were working at a school and we were trying to give certain students advice about behavior. And one day we saw their parents pick them up. And as soon as they exited the school ground, they got into a fist fight. And him and I looked at each other like, what do you do? You know, you, you, you give them this boat and then they take the boat out into a tsunami and <laughs> what's going to happen so i i appreciate your emphasis on the different layers of approaching those people and yeah it, i could tell you as one microcosm it's happening in in ethiopia and i see it with different parishes that i serve um in ethiopia there's this thing and i was born and raised here but i i visited a lot and so i would i would see this this stuff to be able to compare Everyone lives walking distance from a church. All of the major cities were pretty much established with a church in the center and the city forming in circles around that church. And Ethiopia really has a, a unique history in that it was a church of empire but it was the smaller empire. It wasn't the Roman Empire. It was the, the empire in the periphery, in, in the Horn of Africa. And, and yet, though it was the smaller empire, it lasted longer. It didn't go away in the 1400s. It kept going until 1974, until 
we too were struck by the communists and again had a similar situation it's incredible actually how many of the things that you've described are also with with us but by virtue of of churches being walking distance people would make the sign of the cross every time they walk by or drive by the church there would be services every day uh, not just always liturgical services in the morning which there often was uh, at least several times a month and at the monasteries every day and, and the monasteries are not that far away people visit very frequently but there are evening teachings and hymns that you could learn and and biblical studies so there there's so many opportunities whereas here people live more fragmented more distant and they're traveling an hour an hour and a half to get to that parish once a week and if they're truly blessed twice a week you know and and some of them once a month or once every other month so that that's definitely a totally different experience i'm curious how did you get into teaching did you begin teaching as a layman first because you have kind of a unique experience as someone who you said you were not raised religiously a lot of times people have some sort of foundation some scripture they heard as a kid or something like me i was raised nominally orthodox but my parents never in their life were consistent sunday christians but they also were not non-believers you know in in any explicit uh, sense they just kind of nominally raised me orthodox and took me to the high holidays the way that you described yeah i would say uh enthusiasm in the good sense carried me along um i remember in my first you know parish or two wanting to be involved in some way uh, and so I think in one case it manifested as helping start a men's group and we would read books. Um, you know, um, as my wife will tell you, I'm something of a liturgical geek. So, you know, early in my conversion, I started reading a lot and like assimilating knowledge, which as we both know can be dangerous for a new convert. Um, but, you know, this translated from, you know, trying to start men's groups or you know, study groups to actually, you know, beginning to teach uh, in RCIA classes. So those who wanted to join the, the Roman church, you know, instructing them uh, in the faith uh, to, you know, eventually leading Bible studies, sharing the fruits of what I was learning in my the theological studies and my master's studies. You know, and I remember at one point, you know, taking a graduate class in theology and saying, you know, I feel like every adult Christian should at least take some level of advanced theological studies just to be able to take their faith and apply it to the world in which we live you know and I, I stand by that today certainly you don't have to know theology to understand god right uh, evagrius of ponticus the theologian is the one who prays and the one who prays is the theologian but we put so much time and effort into reading about uh, personal finances or about how our car works or about how the world is going to end and we we put so little time and emphasis into reading about like our faith and what it means and how it works uh, or the scriptures right as you talked about earlier you know feasting on the scriptures so i feel like as adults for the most part we could do probably a lot more to to stay with our faith so all of that to say um my love for the faith my love for the church my love for people led me to offer myself to uh, you know ver offer various classes Early on, I would just simply take things I had learned in class, look at my class notes, clean them up, and then turn that into a multiple week, you know, Bible study or presentation series. And now, you know, I work with uh, those who are coming into the church or those who are interested in learning more about it. Uh, and, you know, sometimes preparing married couples, not in formal marriage prep, but we've discovered that sometimes it helps a couple getting married to actually update them on their faith first before preparing them for marriage so they actually understand what it is to be a christian so that you can then teach them what it is to be in a christian marriage i mean um, but zoom has helped quite a bit right because like many parishes you've described we're a commuter parish people drive from as far as two hours away to get to us but on zoom if you offer a class in the middle of the week more people can come so to yes. speak by just tuning in yeah oh now i can pick your brain on something that i wasn't planning on but it's uh here this is the benefit of leaving some room for the spirit as they say in american christianity i had a very successful uh google meet was the brand i chose just because i heard about zoom bombs in the beginning and i wanted no part of that but uh i had a very successful i would say and fruitful uh, internet bible study throughout the pandemic so um, you know, 
sometimes it would be as many as 30 people and sometimes it would be 7 to 15 and I wasn't one to focus on numbers. We actually have one one time where we recorded and I put it up because I had a guest speaker as a friend in the, from the West Syriac tradition and he's a he's a general semeticist he knows uh pretty much all the living and dead <laughs> semitic languages wow. uh i had him on one day to speak to them about the syriac or the aramaic uh, church that that eastern tradition to give them a feel for it but other than that you know we went through the whole book of acts all of galatians all of ephesians and about half of luke and uh, so we used our time and we used our time wisely. And those people who showed up every week, they were fed a lot and they were given a really good, strong base. And at a certain point, my, my particular parish, which is the seat, uh, it's the cathedral, the seat of the bishop, was actually closed longer than others in the area. And as you, I don't know the situation in Virginia, but in California, you know, the pandemic ended in Texas and Florida, maybe about six months in, but in California, it's still going, you know, it was still going, uh, you know, in the environments we work, we are mandated now to have, uh, you know, KN95 masks. I mean, it's continuing and, and we've had on and off uh, expansions and con contractions with what does it look like to be particularly an Orthodox church service where you kiss the cross, you kiss the gospel, you receive communion. Like these are fundamental parts of, of that faith, which you don't have in Zoom land or in the in, in Google Meet, which I use. And so, sorry, this is long-winded, but to give you my experience, I felt at some point, no matter how fruitful this is, I need to bring people back in real life. And so I've I've tried to do that. And it has not been as successful. I, I've had a few uh, a few people return. Uh, you got a handful, really a handful, and we've been able to do some things, but it's nowhere near what the level of education and the depth was. We would spend an hour and a half together, you know, on Google Meet. Uh, you know, I pushed it to ten o'clock, so I didn't force people to wake up super early. Our normally our main liturgy begins at seven, and we have some pre-liturgical things that begin at six a.m. You know, that's a totally different ask to say, uh, come at 10 with your coffee in your pajamas at home, you know, uh, with the with the screen on or not. So if you just have any thoughts on the education on Zoom versus bringing it to real life, is there is there any balance there that that you seek? Because it's obviously, like you said, it grants access to more people. But is is there something missing? Yeah, I have to, I want to actually answer your question, but I'm going to start in a different place. <laughs> it is my understanding. Um, I read a book um, a while ago. It was called The Atheist Delusion, The Christian Revolution and Its Fashionable Enemies by David Bentley Hart. Some love him, some hate him. <laughs> and, I have uh, his New Testament right here. <laughs> I uh, put it on my shelf right up here. In fact. <laughs> Um, so he taught, and it's, in that book, he kind of, I would say, debunks the modern narrative of how Christianity destroyed the noble pagan culture that came before it. And why do I start there? One of the things he cites is that it was well known that in times of pandemics, which were very common, plagues were very common in the world history, we're just spoiled moderns. And I'm not trying to make light of anything. Um, and, but the Christians were well known as the ones who would f go into the cities where an outbreak was raging at risk of their own lives to minister to others, to mm -hmm. bury, to care for them. Whereas the pagans were known for fleeing to the hills to save their own lives. So part of the dynamic and part of the challenge we are dealing with is that we have forgotten that Christ has trampled down death by death. That doesn't mean that we make light of health emergencies, but it does mean that we have to be reminded that preserving our earthly life is not our number one priority. Growing in the likeness of Christ is. And so we have to put sort of this whole thing into its proper context, right? Because it's really a competing religious narrative that we're looking at. 
with a competing priesthood, <laughs> a, com a competing sense of heaven, a competing sense of hell, a competing sense of heresy. Like, I'm not going to go into a rant on this, but early Christians would encourage each other with something we would consider morbid. They would say to each other, remember your death. Mm -hmm. They didn't say it to be morbid. They said it to remember one day you will die and you will, you will be judged. Live accordingly. So we have to reground people in the fact that this life is not given to us forever. The life to come is forever. We live this life with the expectation of judgment. And we understand that we will be judged quite simply on the criteria we find in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, popularly known as the sheep and the goats. In our tradition, we call it the you know, parable of the last judgment. We read it every year on the threshold of Great Lent. Um, so that's where I want to start the answer to your question. You know, our faith is an incarnational faith. We are meant to be in community. We're meant to be in relationship. We are sheep. Um, so the isolation is very, I think, psychologically, very emotionally, very spiritually damaging. And so we have to remember that Zoom catechesis or Google Meet catechesis, it's a substitute and it's a workaround. Um, and sometimes it's all we have, uh, depending on where we live in the United States or in the world and in the conditions. But the ideal is to try to bring you know, our people back to the extent they're comfortable. Um, yep. The challenge is, we you know are living inside of a narrative that has used fear um for two years and so people rightly so are afraid right christ says fear not <laughs> so what do we do with this we preach the gospel and we remind people of who we are and who christ is and we invite them back we've seen a strange phenomena and i know other orthodox churches have seen a strange phenomena of an influx of newcomers and inquirers so our numbers are back almost to pre-pandemic numbers that's great but we have a lot of new faces and a lot of old faces haven't come back so that means we have a lot of new people how do they found us our live stream <laughs> um but i i listen to other you know orthodox priests on podcasts and things like that and they're all talking because they're all having the same phenomena Somehow people are finding the churches of the Christian East and they're coming in. So certainly we want our people to come back, but sometimes God tells us, here are your new people. So like you said, we don't focus on the numbers, but we do focus on preserving the tradition that's been handed to us and making it available to current and future generations. And those you know, who are able to come back will come back. For those who are afraid, we encourage them. Maybe like the good shepherds, we go to them. We say, we miss you come back it's nice to be on zoom it's even better to be together to drink coffee to talk so we do the best we can with zoom but like you said it's not uh it's not a long-term substitute it's a workaround i mean thank thank you for that sound <clears throat> advice um the arabic that i'm more familiar with and i don't know arabic uh, but it helps that i know a couple semitic languages uh maybe a few uh is the from the coptic or the alexandrian right and uh same with the greek although we have a little greek in ours uh it's actually very funny if you ever come on a good friday to the ethiopian church they use like a million greek words and if you ask a lot of the faithful they have no idea what they're saying it, it's it's really phenomenal we we already had you know a few greek words like prospera uh you know stuff like that uh and all the you know the names of places and the names of saints uh, that have been in in our language for a couple thousand years now but more recent you know additions also exist and um from our tradition we say kiri eleison which is of the kiri eleison in the greek and they say it as well in the coptic tradition uh, in the coptic churches i know they also say pantokrator for almighty or all powerful uh, we we say ahaze uh, kullu which is more he grabs everything he grabs oh, wow. all uh, it's our it's our particular way of, of saying omnipotent or almighty. Um, and then I know, again, in the Coptic tradition, they say Yaraburha, for Lord have mercy. Is, is there any um, <clears throat> any words from Galatians that stuck out to you or anything that you could share with us from the liturgy of John Chrysostom, be it Greek, Arabic, 
or English and any or other final thoughts that you'd like to share with my audience, I'd like to give you the last word. Yeah, um, the same phrase, three languages. Kiri Elaysan, Yara Borham, Lord have mercy. Um, that's, that's our fundamental attitude before God. And when we encounter people, when we encounter the difficulties of the world, we say to the Lord in our hearts, we look to him, Lord have mercy. And it's, I think, an admission that on our own, we simply can't do it. Like we can pretend that we can do it on our own, but it's sort of like looking at that little kid who's trying to lift something that's three times his weight. And you're just waiting for him to give up and ask for help. You know, God won't force himself on us. He waits, um, not because he's mean, not because he doesn't like us, but he needs us to learn experientially how much we need him. And, you know, the most fundamental prayer, no matter how busy you are, no matter how educated or uneducated you feel you may be, Lord have mercy, or whatever your language happens to be. Uh, those are my final words for tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much. Shukran.